Rich Lund. Let's get into it. Last year I did an AMA request video where I requested questions and topics and then viewers voted on which topics we should do a video of this summer. Now one of the videos that garnered enough votes to be in the top three came from J1 and he requested a video showing how to hand pair monarch butterflies together. For those who don't know, hand pairing is the term used when a human selects which boy and which girl butterfly are gonna get together and they hand pair them, they cause them to mate. This technique is used so that way people can of course breed monarchs. Now, I am not a breeder. In the video where I announced what the AMA results were and who the winners were and what topics, well, I made it clear that I wouldn't be doing such a video. I wasn't going to show people how to hand pair monarchs. But I did say that in place of that, what I would do is explain why I'm not a breeder. So it's not exactly what J1 wanted, but I wanted to show him the respect of at least explaining myself. The first place to start must be here. I am officially neutral on the topic of breeding. I am Switzerland. I neither discourage it nor do I promote it. But also, not promoting means I don't educate people on how to do it. When it comes to the breeding of monarchs for academic and scientific reasons, there are absolutely some responsible and correct ways to do it. But emphasis on the word responsible. To ensure that it's done correctly without any foreseen negative consequences, it takes a whole lot of work and effort. And on the flip side of this though, there are definitely some wrong ways to do it. Ways that have some negative consequences. The breeding of monarch butterflies by hobbyists is a sensitive and controversial topic from the standpoint of many experts out there. And let's be clear, when I'm saying a monarch expert, I'm referring to people who have spent their life's work studying the monarch butterfly and its ecology. These are people who have degrees on the subjects that are pertinent to the monarch butterfly and likely also have multiple published papers that have actually added to our scientific knowledge of this animal. Those are the experts. And as I've said many times, I am not an expert. I have experience, but even so, even if I continue to raise monarchs for several decades further, I still would not have earned that title. I'm just a guy trying to help out the monarchs. But in order to do that responsibly, as much as I can, I refer to the experts that are out there and what they have to say on it. But when it comes to trying to do that, there are times where we may encounter a patch of gray area where not all the experts are 100% in agreement with each other. The best I can do in those situations is try to assess and communicate what those concerns are. So these concerns that I'm about to discuss are about monarch hobbyist breeding monarchs. Okay, here's the first one. What are the genetic implications of somebody doing this? If a human is choosing which two monarchs are going to get together, then we are subverting natural selection. Rather than nature getting to select for which ones are the best fit, Instead, usually if somebody's going to breed monarchs, it tends to be monarchs that were not wild caught, but instead monarchs that they themselves have reared. This can at times then have the potential to pass on genes to a new generation that otherwise nature may have weeded out. Now when it comes to this concern though, it's not likely to have any real devastating effects. Most likely from just one generation of a breeding program, the monarchs produced probably don't have any real bad genes, and even if they did, well those bad genes are going to be weeded out by nature. After all, if the gene is good at getting passed on and spreading throughout the population, well then we really need to reconsider why did we label it, why did we think it was a bad gene in the first place. But it's also worth pointing out that this can lead to changing up the local population around you, changing the genetic diversity that's out there. If just one person in an area does it like just once for a generation, that's probably not really a big deal. But if many hobbyists started doing this and many people were doing it in the same location, well then that might have some negative implications. Now, right on the heels of that one, the second concern deals with adaptation. If a breeder isn't just getting a boy and a girl together and producing one generation of eggs, but instead, if we're doing a multi-generational process, then that could result very much in changing the adaptation of the monarchs that we're producing. After a few generations, in truth, we wouldn't really have monarchs that are best fit for survival out in nature, but instead monarchs that are best fit for survival in the rearing process that we're doing. Just like with the previous category, all those concerns about the genetics and potentially less than optimal genes and also the genetic diversity of the local area, those concerns are only heightened. But once again, the same counter argument exists. If these really are less than optimal genes, well then nature's gonna weed them out. But different than that, doing what I do and many of you do, taking in wild eggs, wild source monarchs and rearing those to adults and then releasing them, well that ensures that we haven't changed anything about their genetics. It's still the genetics that are out there in the wild population, still reflective of that wild population's diversity. Okay, the third one's a quick one. I personally, myself, do not wish to make a video that could equip people with the knowledge to do this, and then they might be using it for what I consider to be unethical reasons. I have zero problem taking a very firm stance on this. 
I do not think that monarch butterflies are jewelry or ornaments of any kind. Even when wild monarchs that are deceased from natural reasons, when they're turned into earrings or a necklace or a brooch, that's still promoting the idea that, yes, monarch butterflies are a type of jewelry or some other type of ornament. If I were to make a video that shows how to breed monarchs, well, then somebody could be using that video to do something that I'm very much against and trying to make a profit from it as well. Now, such a person who wants to do that could probably still go about figuring it out somehow, but still, I don't need to be the one who contributes to it. Moving right along. The next concern deals with breeding and rearing and releasing monarchs out of season. In areas where monarchs are migrating, places that are temperate climates, well, the monarchs let me know when we're done. They stop laying eggs. But if somebody is breeding, rearing, and releasing monarchs, maybe slightly out of season, maybe during the migratory season, and those monarchs that are released, if they're not in diapause from that batch, could that somehow cause an influence and effect to the migratory path in that location? We still don't fully understand the migration. It's still very much being studied. So while I can't actually articulate what the exact negative consequence would be, it still could be out there and we wouldn't really know it until it happens. Now the fifth concern is actually one that some experts have for what I and many of you do, rearing monarchs. And they have these concerns with those who might want to breed. Those concerns being the issues of overcrowding, sanitation, disease, uh, parasites. These are legitimate concerns for sure, whether someone's breeding or just rearing wild sourced eggs. And this one definitely could have some severe consequences for the population, at least in a local area or possibly as a whole. I'm of the opinion though that if somebody's going to be rearing wild sourced monarchs, that this usually means that they care for the animal. And if they care for the animal, they're probably willing to do the proper things to make sure that things are kept sanitary doing things to avoid overcrowding, doing things to avoid NPV or the OE parasite. I would also be of the opinion that people are going to continue this hobby, so why not equip them with the information to do it correctly rather than to just say it shouldn't be done. When it comes to breeding though, people who are breeding are usually trying to do it to reach some sort of very large number. And if somebody is mass rearing monarchs all at the same time, well then the issues of overcrowding and disease and stress, those are only magnified. For those who are rearing wild source monarchs, I do have a video on sanitation which can help show you what procedures I use, and then also a video that deals with overcrowding and tries to shed some light on what kind of stress the monarchs can be in if they're in too confined of quarters. Links are in the description below. Now the last one to bring up is the one that I think tops the list, and it's maybe not so much a concern as it is a question of logic. What is the goal of us raising monarchs, and is breeding even in line with that goal? In the original Raising Monarchs series, parts 1 through 5, at the end of part 5, I bring up a special message. I bring up something that I ask you to consider. And it's what I think is maybe the most important aspect of all of this. Even if the raising of monarchs that we do during the summer does somewhat boost the migratory population, it doesn't really mean much if the next year they come back to the same amount of milkweed. The best evidence suggests that the reason for the decline in the monarch numbers has been due to a loss of habitat, specifically milkweed. If our long-term goal is to try to get the North American population to a size where it is sustainable and doesn't need our help but can just thrive on its own, well then the answer to that lies in the planting of milkweed, not necessarily in the raising of monarchs, and definitely not just in raising high volumes, high numbers of them. In raising monarchs, it should be about quality, not quantity. And also, if somebody has the time in the summer to raise 500 or 1,000 monarchs, well, what if instead they raised one to 200 monarchs and used any of that extra time to plant more milkweed? I mean, if they're willing to raise them in such high numbers, they're obviously passionate about this, but the long-term solution really is all about restoring the habitat. And when it comes to planting milkweed, I'm not just talking about, you know, growing your own in your yard, but planting it where you can, talking and reaching out to different municipalities, seeing if you can get a local way station at a park. These are efforts that we can be doing. Now, the same argument could be raised, no pun intended, with those of us who do raise wild sourced eggs. Why not just skip all of that and just plant milkweed? But for me, I think the difference lies in the numbers and the value of raising monarchs. It gives the people who are doing it a emotional connection with that animal. It definitely facilitates in learning about the animal and learning about their plight. And the most important part, I think, is that it definitely is a catalyst for getting people to plant milkweed in the first place. For some out there, they planted milkweed first in the hopes of, you know, helping out pollinators and the monarch butterfly. But then, after they see caterpillars falling victim to different predators or diseases or just disappearing overnight, they decide to start taking them in and raising them. But for many others out there, it was the raising of monarchs that came first. 
they hear about it as an enjoyable summer hobby, and so they try their hand at it. But in doing it, they maybe learn more about the monarch's plight and learn about the ways to help it, including planting milkweed. Or in other cases, too, it's just because they want to have a more successful season and make things easier on themselves, so they decide then to plant milkweed in their own yards. If you get somebody to raise monarchs, that person is much more likely to take you up on the idea of planting milkweed. I'm not saying some won't just plant it. Of course, there's people out there that will do that. But if you can get people to raise monarchs, and that really helps in spreading the awareness of what's happening, let's face it, they're eye candy. Showing your neighbors, getting them curious, taking them out to different demonstrations or art fairs and releasing them there can be a great way to get people inspired about the monarch butterfly and to get them then interested in wanting to plant milkweed. But again, all of that can be accomplished by rearing wild sourced eggs in reasonable numbers. Whatever that reasonable number is though, breeding and rearing and releasing 10 times that number isn't actually helping out the long-term goal. Think about it. The number of monarchs that make the migration this year, that number, more or less, is due to how much milkweed was out there and available, plus or minus the occasional random severe weather event. Now pretend with me, whatever number of monarchs that is, what if we could magically just double it, or even triple it? If we could magically increase the number to such large amounts, that wouldn't really do anything if the next year the monarchs don't have enough milkweed there to support that population size. In short, the mass rearing of monarchs really isn't in line with the long-term goal. And so if we have that extra time, why not use it to plant milkweed and actually try to give a long-term solution to this? So there it is. That's why I myself do not choose to breed. That's why I don't make any videos about it. If us hobbyists out there truly wish to help the monarch butterflies in the North American populations reach sustainable levels, then the solution truly is and the focus should be on planting milkweed. And by the way, I am now on Instagram for those who are interested, and you are welcome to follow me, stalk me, whatever people do on Instagram. However, if you could, if you have comments about the monarch butterflies, please continue to leave them in the comment section of videos. That's the easiest way for me to get back to you. I'm Rich Lund. Thank you for listening. And now I'm about to release some of my last monarchs for the season. And that's also then going to let me know it's almost time to start collecting those seed pods and harvesting some seeds for the future generations next year. I'll catch you next time, and plant milkweed. Bye.